Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, What's Your Country's Footprint? Where we'll be looking at environmental footprint indicators and multi-regional input-output tables with experts from the Swiss Federal Office for the Environment, the University of British Columbia, the School of Ecological Systems Design at ETH, Zurich, and Leiden University's Institute of Environmental Sciences. My name is John Mon from the GGKP, the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership, a global network of organizations and experts working to equip the policy, business, and finance communities with the knowledge, guidance, data, and tools they need to green their operations. It's a fact of life that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Over the past few weeks, I'd wager that all of us has taken a look at a map or a set of indicators about the spread of the coronavirus in our regions and around the world. In today's webinar, we're going to be looking at how some of the world's leading experts are tackling another crisis, the environmental crisis, from the emerging threats around climate to water scarcity and biodiversity loss, among others. The GDKP is proud to support these and other partners in measuring the transition to a green economy. Today's webinar includes several friends from the GDKP expert working group on metrics and indicators. The group is currently exploring knowledge gaps around measuring the economic opportunities arising from the transition to a green economy. In today's webinar, we'll hear about the flip side of that equation. With all of our economic activity, are we approaching global limits? In other words, what is our environmental footprint? We'll delve deep into a study on environmental footprint indicators, which aim to measure precisely that. And it's important to note that the study received generous support from the Swiss government, who are also with us today. Before we get started, I'd like to note that a full recording of today's webinar, including the presentations, will be available on gdkp.org slash webinar footprint indicators, if you want to go that far, or do a search, and that will be available shortly after the webinar. We'd appreciate if following the webinar, you would be able to take a few minutes uh, to complete our short survey. Your feedback is very important and it helps us shape our future webinars so we can deliver them all the better the next time around. Finally, I'd like to encourage all of you to raise questions throughout the webinar through the question box. It's a great opportunity to engage directly with the experts on today's panel. So I am now delighted to welcome our moderator, Stephanie Helweg, Professor of Ecological Systems Design at ETH Zurich. Stephanie is an industrial engineer by training with experience in sustainable waste management, energy production, and others. Her current research focus focuses on life cycle assessment and industrial ecology. So without further ado, Stephanie, I hand it over to you. Great, so hello everybody. It's a pleasure to moderate this webinar. Um, it's of very much interest um, because we are doing also a lot of research in this area, as you heard about life cycle assessment, about uh, industrial ecology, supply chain management in my group. So I'm also very interested in looking forward very much to the topics that we will discuss. So what exactly will we discuss? We will talk about environmental footprints and we will look especially at country footprint indicators, looking at multi-regional input output analysis. The background is that we have lots of new indicators, especially from the life cycle assessment methodology, and they offer methodologies to quantify impacts, including climate change, water stress, land use related biodiversity impacts. And together with multi regional input output analysis, we can now quantify this footprint, these footprints for countries and also for trade flows between these countries. And today we will get to know these methodologies and we will discuss opportunities of how we can integrate such indicators with the GAP framework. Um, so there are various um, initiatives of UNEP currently dealing with these methodologies. So we have the Lifecycle Initiative um, from UNEP, we have an International Resource Panel, 
We have the Green Growth Knowledge Partnerships and we have representatives from all these initiatives here. I think one of the questions which we can discuss today is um, how can the tremendous usefulness of all this work um, lead into synergies and how can we actually make sure that we have consistent method, consistent messages from all these initiatives. So I understand this as a kickoff of making this link and to kind of start exchanging information, exploiting the, the synergies and starting up the discussion um, between all the different actors. Um, the format of how we will proceed is we will first have five presentations. Um, if you have questions from the audience, please post them on the chat. After the presentations, if everybody keeps the time, we will discuss some questions of understanding. So um, only if something was unclear to you, please post the question. After all the presentations, we will then have a panel discussion. And that is the time to discuss questions of contents, let's say um, discussion questions. So please also put those on the chat. We will try to take notice of them and to integrate them here in the discussion. With that, let me uh, finalize the introduction and I would like to introduce the first speaker to you, Niklas Nierhof. He is from the Swiss Federal Office of Environment from the economic um, section. And his work deals mainly with green economy indicators and ecological footprints. And this is also what he will talk about today. Um, he will talk about the importance of environmental footprint indicators. Niklas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you very much, John. I'm delighted to be here. Why are environmental footprint indicators important to take into account? Well, they complete the picture, or at least they add a very important perspective to indices and to the assessment of environmental impacts. Because um, with the globalization of international trade, um, also environmental impacts are being globalized as a matter of speaking. And um, environmental footprint indicators look at the consumption-based environmental impact um, from a perspective of the end consumer and the impact that it has inside of a country and outside. Please, next slide. Well, um, country level environmental footprint indicators address this by looking at environmental impacts from a consumption perspective, as I said. This allows us to take spillovers into account on the next slide. And also to break country environmental footprints down to a personal level. And next click, please. And again, the next click. And then with this um, individual environmental footprints, it is possible to compare them with the planetary boundaries, both at the individual level, but also on a country level. And uh, third, um, it makes it also possible to break them down to a per capita level. Um, this can give us guidance to lifestyle choices too, but um, I will focus on the first two in this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, for example, to, to answer the question, is Switzerland a sustainability leader or a sustainability laggard? On the next slide. Um, showing an international comparison, for example, on the next slide, you will see that Switzerland from a consumption, uh, from a domestic production uh, perspective per capita is among the best countries. And if you let this small Swiss mountain goat, the Ibex jump, you will see that it's on the right and one of the countries with a low um, domestic production per capita emissions. Next, please. And again, next. Then when looking at the greenhouse gas footprint per capita, this is the consumption perspective, then the Swiss mountain goat, the Ibex, will jump all the way to the left. And yeah, that was a bit too far. <laughs> Well, Switzerland is uh, in any case, one of the countries with the highest um, per capita consumption-based emissions. Next, please. And again, next slide. 
this um, has also implications for indices. For example, here we see the GAP plus index and the green growth index by the Global Green Growth Institute. Um, those two tables look at uh, countries of very high human development index or within Europe and then both um, indices, Switzerland is somewhere in the middle. But um, this uh, feasibility study done by ETH um, shows that when taking more um, environmental footprint indicators into account, and not only the raw material consumption, then most probably um, Switzerland will also um, fall a bit more behind in the ranking. Okay. Next, please. This will also have um, implications or would also have implications for other indices being on um, sustainable competitiveness or environmental performance indices or in general also SDG indices. Next slide, please. Also, the planetary boundaries, uh, environmental footprint indicators make a comparison allocated to a country and a per capita level possible. And on the next slide, I, uh, you will see the planetary boundary assessment done by Stefan and colleagues in 2015, which show um, the biggest risks um, at biodiversity, climate change and biochemical flows. But if everyone consumed like the Swiss, and this is possible to answer um, because of the environmental footprint indicators, on the next slide, you will see um, how the situation would look like globally. Well, and you see the impact would be most mostly um, with regards to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Next click and the next slide, please. As I said, when breaking down consumption-based environmental footprint indicators, you can further break them down to the individual level. And on the next slide, um, you will see how we try to communicate this or use this to communicate to the Swiss population what the biggest um, environmental impacts and also leverages of their consumption behaviors are. And with the next clicks, you will see that it's unlike popular belief, it's not just recycling, but your nutrition, it's housing, it's driving cars, and it's also taking the plane. And on the next slide, I will try to summarize and wrap it up. Using environmental footprint indicators puts progress measurement into a new perspective, the consumption perspective, and this makes it possible to start from a global level, go to a country level with the next clicks, please, and then break it down to individual level and use this to compare it to the planetary boundaries. The further presentations of this webinar that I very much look, out, look, look forward to see them will focus, however, on the comparison of global and country level environmental footprints. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. You, you kept perfectly the time and we would have questions for understanding now, but I don't see any in the chat, Niklas. Um, I think your presentation was probably very clear. So thank you very much. Um, then we have time to discuss this afterwards. So um, I would yeah. suggest then, um, as we didn't have any questions, to go on to the next speaker. Um, and that is Jose Pineda. Um, he is a senior researcher at the United Nations Development Programme and he is also adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia, an expert of assessment of trade and open macroeconomics, and he will give us some background on the GAP framework. Please go ahead. Excellent, Stephanie. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, um, I wanted to, to, to highlight the, the importance of, of, of this webinar for for, as Stephanie said at the beginning, it's, it's important to, to combine all these, these different efforts uh, and to try to have a coherent common understanding. And I think uh, footprint indicators will add a lot to the analysis and to our understanding of how we can measure progress uh, towards an inclusive green economy. Next. So what I wanted to talk to you uh, today is to do a briefly um, discussion about what the green economy uh, measurement framework uh, is about and how it can potentially benefit uh, tremendously from the inclusion uh, of footprint indicators. 
Um, so I think that the starting point of, of our uh, discussion should be uh, what is the, the narrative that this measurement tries to uh, capture. And uh, this is just a friendly reminder that an inclusive green economy is, is a tool to deliver sustainable development goals. I think in that sense, it, 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 it connects to a broader set of development agenda. And the idea is trying to tackle three of the main challenges that humanity is facing. This idea of tackling persisting poverty, uh, trying to tackle the inequitable sharing of global growth prosperity, and as already was mentioned uh, by Nicholas, the idea of doing all of this within uh, uh, the planetary boundary. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, the Green Economy Pro uh, Progress Measurement Framework is trying to, to, to achieve. It's trying to provide a, a sound formulation that helps us to measure progress towards that inclusive green economy, but at the same time, is trying to provide a, a tool that will guide policymaking by adding value to the existing uh, variety of efforts to measure and to calculate uh, uh, progress towards the SDGs. Next, please. This slide summarizes uh, what are the main components of the green economy measurement framework. The first component is what we call the green economy progress index, which is an index that is uh, designed to track progress in key green economy indicators. It's trying to capture the uh, how these changes, this progress in these indicators are compared relative to desired changes, to the goals that policy makers, makers are setting on, on the evolution of these uh, indicators. And the idea is trying to capture a little bit what is the, 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 the changes in our current well-being. Now, this index, as any composite index, is um, it's essential for the index to, to, to understand the weighting. And the weighting is trying to, to present and to, to give a significant importance to what are the key targets and policy goals that um, any country, any policymaker is setting uh, to, for, for changing in, in terms of policymaking, but also keeping track of what are the critical thresholds, as already was explained, one of those critical thresholds are the planetary uh, boundaries so that we do this progress within those boundaries. Uh, the final score uh, that we calculate will give us an indication of the overall multidimensional progress that countries achieve or depending on the unit of analysis, but uh, in, in the example that I will talk today is about countries that they achieve in terms of moving forward towards an inclusive green economy. The second component, it's a dashboard of sustainability indicators. And I think this is where the, this framework could benefit the most by the discussion and the introduction of footprint indicators. Um, and the idea is trying to, to track what are the main forms of natural capital, what are the key stocks that humanity needs in order to operate safely. Uh, and finally, there is a ranking that combines information between uh, the, what the index is saying and what the dashboard of sustainability uh, indicators are, are giving to us and give an overall ranking at those countries. Uh, in the next slides, I will explain uh, in more detail some of the characteristics of the index. The main features that we, you will see on the Green Economy uh, Progress Index will be the focus on changes. Why is that important? That was a methodological choice because if we wanted to, to have a measurement that encouraged uh, progress, that encouraged uh, a transition, we, we choose directly to measure in terms of changes over time. Second, we wanted to do it relative to target, to try to highlight that this transition towards an inclusive green economy has to be driven by a set of policy goals and we need then to track how much progress are we doing relative to those um, to those policy goals. Then uh, it uses uh, in their calculation and the intrinsic weighting of the system uh, critical thresholds. Why? Because we want to uh, do the progress, as I said initially, relative to uh, the planetary boundaries and within that. Finally, uh, we we allow different valuation. 
so that countries in this case or units uh, could be subnational, uh, could have different valuations across the different dimensions that are included. Why? Because that will depend on their targets and their initial conditions. So if you have an initial condition relative to the critical threshold, which is more favorable, that will give you a different weight, a different signal of policy priorities than if you are lagging behind significantly. And the final comment that I wanted to make about the, the, the index is that it's flexible. It's flexible enough to be applied to a, a wide range of indicators. I will talk later about one of, one of such applications, but also it's, it's important that we we'll combine things that we wanted to improve and things that we wanted to, to reduce. So we want to have a methodology that is flexible to include uh, these different uh, kind of indicators. Next, please. Then after we do the calculation for the index and we calculate progress for the different dashboard of indicators, we have an overall aggregating uh, rank. And that ranking has a, an important feature. Conceptually, we wanted to have a combined um, number so that we could rank countries and we give them this policy message that you have to be relative to your peer. Uh, you feel a little bit of pressure that you are lagging behind or you're doing well. Uh, but we don't want it to do in a way that we create a new index. Why? Because we were inspired by the strong sustainability uh, framework that will say that these key sustainability indicators uh, may not necessarily have substitutability in the sense that we cannot just deplete them uh, in order to achieve more progress into the index. So we did, uh, and we explained in the, in, the, in the methodology, a way to combine the two and a good way to do that so that we could have the overall information without creating a new index was to rank countries according to the least performing uh, progress in these two dimensions. So this way we will we'll, we'll convey, uh, convey two set of uh, critical information. One is you will know how you are performing in each of the components. You will know how you are performing in the critical uh, environmental sustainability indicators. You will know how you are doing in the index, but also you will know where are you lagging the most. And that's an important policy message. So if you want to increase your position in the ranking, you have to tackle the, uh, the policy aspect in which you need action the most. Next. Uh, this is just to illustrate uh, what are the main indicators that we are using. Uh, the ones in blue are the ones that we have on the uh, index. And so where we have admit some sort of suitability and in there you will see indicators covering all the multidimensional aspects of an inclusive green economy, let's say access to the services, renewable energy, green trade, uh, material footprint. So we have incorporated a variety of indicators that cover the, uh, the broad range of objectives under an inclusive green economy. The ones in green are the ones related to environmental sustainability, and these are the ones that could greatly benefit from in the incorporation of footprint indicators. On the right panel, what you have is, is a mapping between some of these indicators and headlines indicators from the SDG, so that we can understand that the transition towards a green economy is, is, is actually a, an instrument to achieve some of these um, SDGs objectives. And Next, please. This is just uh, to show uh, the minimum set of results that I can show, but what, what I wanted to show with this map uh, is, is uh, two things. One, that although the majority of countries, uh, if you see a country on green, it means that it has a, a progress. If you see the green to be a little bit darker, it means that the progress is, 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 is higher. And if you see some a country in red, is, is, is moving in, in the opposite direction. It has, instead of making progress, it has more uh, and, and, and have a negative progress in all these dimensions. And if it's darker, it means that it has been more intensive. Although the majority of countries have made progress, there are a significant number of countries that they are not, and they are moving in the opposite direction. So that gives us an, a, a, an idea that we need to, uh, to, to be vigilant and to keep pushing the agenda so that countries can keep moving forward and the countries that are lagging behind or moving in the opposite direction will change the policy making. Uh, next, please. 
Uh, in terms of flexibility, I wanted just to talk that we, we uh, have recently uh, drafted a paper that we are submitting to, to a journal uh, to do an application of the methodology to tracking SDG number seven. So as I said at the beginning, the methodology is totally flexible. So we could use this methodology to track SDGs. And this is just an illustration of how that can be done. And we selected SDG seven uh, because uh, I think was was pertinent to, to explore uh, that SDG, and it has a lot of data and information for, for, for a significant number of countries. So we choose three critical indicators. One indicator measuring how uh, energy is inclusive, another indicator measuring how green is the energy, and another is measuring e energy efficiency. So we choose indicators about access to electricity, indicators about the share of renewable energy, and indicators about energy intensity per uh, GDP. And we apply this to 183 uh, countries using data publicly, uh, publicly available from the World Development Indicators of the World Bank. Next year. The results, uh, we, as you can notice now, for instance, we have information for more countries, this is 183. From the global exercise, we, we managed only to, to, to have information for 105. So this is already a, a very interesting issue that we could cover more, more globally. And we, we can track progress made by countries in, in all regions. And, and the main message is that, yes, we are making progress in, in many of the dimensions related to, to having an inclusive green energy, but there are challenges in some countries so that this could give information to policymakers uh, in the different regions to see what are the things that they need to improve to keep moving forward and what are the things that they need to really change to move in the right direction. Next please. So I, I just wanted to, to have a, a set of final remarks uh, to, to leave time for, for other presenters and, and, and their interesting inputs. Uh, so I wanted to, to say a few things. One is that the, the measurement framework, the Green Economy Progress Measurement Framework, uh, is focusing on progress, is focusing on the idea that we could evaluate um, what is the evolution of, of a key set of indicators that we choose normative to, to have a meaning according to the narrative of the green economy. And we want to do it in a way that is consistent with a uh, policy making process that is setting targets and a policy making process that needs to be uh, uh, done within the planetary boundary. We, we, we know that this uh, measurement could benefit from the information coming from uh, the footprint uh, indicators. So I think our methodology is flexible enough to not only be applied to different contexts, to be applied, for instance, to the SDGs. To be applied to some national level, but also to be using a different set of indicators and gaining uh, more insights because of that. So with this, I, I will conclude my presentation and I'm looking forward for uh, any questions that we could have now or during uh, the debate, uh, the, the discussion panel. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, also, you kept the time perfectly well, so we have time for questions and meanwhile, we have received questions. So thanks a lot. I will start recapping the first one. So um, one question is, where do the thresholds for the gap index indicators come from? Um, and the person who asked is particularly interested in material footprint and freshwater withdrawal. Uh, Stephanie. I lost. Um, could you understand me? Because I get a message that my audio. Yeah, you froze for a second. So let me let me at least start with one of the first questions. Um, um, the uh, we did this this work for for um, UNEP and, and and Page, and and we did uh, two steps because we one step was to develop the methodology uh, and try to to put the methodology. Uh, out there so that people could have different ideas how to apply it. And then we did an application and a global application. In the global application, 
is where we select a specific uh, thresholds and, and I wanted to explain to people how we, 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 we come up with them. So for indicators uh, related to uh, environment, that is a significant body of evidence. Of course, there is uncertainty about their values. I think uh, nobody uh, could claim that we know with 100% precision what are the, 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 the boundaries of some of these indicators, but uh, I use the best, of, the best available uh, scientific information. So for instance, in material footprint, we use indicators coming from the research from the International Resource Panel, where they did work trying to uh, associate uh, the levels of material footprint uh, with uh, the planetary boundaries. So we use those, those thresholds. For um, protected areas, we, we use the IQ kind of agreement that sets a specific threshold for operating uh, in a safe manner. Uh, for um, air pollution, we use what is the WHO uh, guidelines about PM 2.5 or PM 10, uh, so that we could really use uh, at least the best available information for this kind of threshold. Unfortunately, for indicators more related to social uh, aspects, there are no such, uh, at least even minimum agreement of what a critical threshold could be. And for that, we, we were a little bit pragmatic and would use some of the properties of the distribution of, of, of on countries and say, okay, if a threshold would be, for instance, for inequality, if you have an inequality that is beyond the 75 percentile of inequality in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. These things could be improved, but this yeah. is just to give uh, people a, a, a mix of, of what, what was our, our approach. Yeah. yeah, there are lots more questions. I will try to put them brief. Please also answer brief. One is, um, if you are a high achiever, it's very difficult to um, obtain progress. Does it mean that um, somebody who is already very good on an absolute scale would rate not as good according to this indicator because it measures change? Um, I, well, in principle, uh, that will be a challenge. So the, the question is, what is your peer group that you have uh, to compare it with? And that's what we have been very careful to compare with groups which has a similar uh, level of development. So within, uh, you are always compared within your relevant peer group in that sense would be, if you are a high achiever, you will compare among high achievers. In that sense, that control a little bit for the concern that people may have. Uh, I'm not comparing, let's say, uh, Switzerland with Venezuela. I'm comparing Switzerland with other countries with similar states of development. So in that sense, achieving has more meaning uh, in that comparison. Mm -hmm. And one last question. Um, we have many more, but we push them to the discussion later on. Um, are the index results summarized? If you aggregate, how do you aggregate? And are you making sure that you remain within planetary boundaries? Um, well, that's, that's the, the, the main purpose of the final ranking. The final ranking is saying, okay, I will have an indicator, which is the index, and I will have three in, 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 the, in the application, three critical indicators related to planetary boundaries. The greenhouse gas emission per capita, the land use, and the one related to nitrogen emissions. Those indicators, if you are trespassing them, then your ranking will go down and that's the way we found to combine progress on the index with uh, a clear signal that planetary boundaries should not be uh, trespassed. Okay, um, there are many questions. I will keep them for the discussion. Thank you very much, Jose, for the Thanks. nice presentation and we will see you later on in the discussion again. So with that, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Professor Arnold Tucker. He is Professor of Industrial Ecology and the Director of the Institute of Environmental Studies at Leiden University, CML. Um, Arnold Tucker is, is very known in uh, our field, um, especially because he was um, one or the main creator of the Exiobase uh, multi-regional input-output analysis. And he will talk today about measuring the sustainable development goals with global environmental input output. Arnold, please go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Steffi. Thanks a lot, uh, other organizers, uh, like everybody in the world that do this from home uh, these days. But let's go to the next slide and let's go to contents. Next slide. And the next slide. <laughs> 
first, I want to explain a bit what is an input output table. That are actually the red blocks that you see here in this picture. An input output table divides the economy of a country in a number of economic sectors. And for that sector, for each sector in the economy, the input output table gives you how much value added is created, how much jobs are created, how much income these people have, but also the so-called environmental extensions, how much CO2 a, section, a sector emits, how much direct land use you have, how much direct water use you have. And that is all included in the gray blocks below. Of course, we know since a country like the Netherlands, I think our GDP is half imported and half exported. If you really want to understand how the Netherlands performs, you need to make actually a global multi-regional input output table. So you need to have countries input output tables and link them via trade. You need to understand which sector in which country is trading with another sector. And then what you then all of a sudden have is a global input output table that gives a picture of all the global value change but also the total global value added and all the jobs and all the environmental pressures well you can imagine that a lot of the indicators that you need for sdgs social economic and environmental you really can calculate a lot of them uh, with environmental input output tables next slide please <coughs> Next slide. A very important issue is that the environmental pressures that countries uh, generate is not only within their borders. The picture below indicates, okay, your own country has its emissions, but the country has imports. And of course, via your imports, you drive emissions in the countries from which you import. That is the so-called footprint approach. But what also is true is that if I am a country and I export stuff, then of course, with these products that are exported, I have a certain responsibility for what happens with these products at exports. If I export very few inefficient cars, of course, in a way, I take responsibility for the energy use in the using country. So there are many ways to look at environmental responsibilities. Next slide, please. Ne yeah, this one. The interesting thing now is that these input output tables can handle almost all these kind of perspectives on environmental responsibility. I already explained that an input output table gives you the emissions by sector by country. So it gives you direct information about the direct let's say carbon emissions, the direct land use, the direct resource extraction. But this input output table can also help you to calculate a footprint. And I will try to explain it with a simple example. Let's assume that I invite a moderator to drink a coffee in the Netherlands. Let's assume that Stephanie and I spent five euro of a coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> this input output table now tells you my five euros where they end up, maybe two euros end up with Starbucks, maybe one euro end up with a coffee roaster, maybe one euro end up with a transport company that transports the coffee, maybe 50 cents end up with the farmer in Costa Rica, and maybe 50 cents end up with, let's say, the fertilizers that are bought. And all these elements of my five euros belong to a certain sector in a certain country. But I also know what the total turnover of that sector in a country and the environmental impacts are. And then all of a sudden I can see how my five euro drives environmental impacts in different sectors in different countries and actually gives me a life cycle assessment of the five euro of coffee that I bought. And the interesting thing is that the approach is inherently consistent because everything that is in the gray blocks below is allocated to something in final consumption in a country. You cannot lease carbon emissions, you cannot lose land, you cannot use water. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> Next. And like Nicholas already indicated, you can really do a number of very nice analysis with this. What you, I show here is the carbon footprint by country compared to a two ton per capita goal in 2050. I also show the water footprint per capita versus the human development index. The next two show land use and material use. They show on the left side how much land and how much material is extracted in different regions. And on the right side, you see how much is needed for the consumption in these different countries. On the top, you have the EU, and you see all the time that the EU actually needs much more resources and land for their own consumption than they have themselves. But you can also do other analysis. Totally at the right, you see a picture of what would happen if the poorest people in the world would all be given an income of $1.2.5. That is SDG number one. But they're going to spend more. Of course, then you have more environmental impacts. And here we calculated the trade-offs with water, land, and carbon emissions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so input-output analysis seems the wonder tool, but there is a very big but. The problem is that no statistical office builds global input-output tables. A statistical office works for one country, and that is where they have their mandate to gather data. Global input-output tables only have been made by four groups of scientists, and recently the OECD. What are the limitations that they face? First, only 70 or 80 countries out of the 180 that we have in the world build input-output tables for themselves, and they are often very aggregated. That is logical because for economic purposes, if you want to know something about agriculture, mining and energy, all these sectors, they are maybe 5% of your GDP. It is for an economist totally not interesting to know a lot about agriculture because they can contribute so little to GDP. However, for us environmental people, detail in these sectors is of utmost importance. Agriculture, for instance, is responsible for more than 80% of land use and more than 70% of water use. And we all know that if someone has a vegan diet, the impact on land use and water use is much lower as if you are a beef eater. But if I cannot see the production of cows and I cannot see the production of cereals specifically in the output table, that difference gets totally lost and you get stupid results. Second or third, many countries don't even have environmental pressure data. I work with a PhD from Indonesia. They have good resource extraction data. They have some carbon emission data, but that's it. They don't have toxicity data and so on. So what do we do with Indonesia if we want to build a global input output table? And the last but not least is that Statistical offices all over the world are not consistent. If you add up what all the statistical offices report as exports, that is larger than all the statistical offices report as imports. So the Economist published five years ago a nice paper on exports to Mars. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we people that compile these <coughs> uh, databases have to develop all kinds of tricks. And I'm not going to explain them in detail, but one of the things that we always have to do is actually adjust national input output tables to make sure we have a balanced global total. And that implies that, next slide please, that from the five input output tables we have at this moment in the world, you cannot really say the one is really better as the other. There is no single good way of making this. Uh, there is no single good way of, of doing things. We have to work with conflicting data and make choices. For instance, you can calculate carbon emissions by using energy balances of the EEA with emission factors. That is what 
I did. And then we have emissions that are consistent with energy flows. You can also say, I trust the Edgar database, a totally different database. But then your emissions are not consistent with energy flows. Well, it's a choice. Nobody can say that I am wrong or that my colleague is better or the other way around. Next slide, please. And that's the last. So this is an overview of the five databases that are out there. What you basically see is that many of them, GTAP, ICAO, WIOT, are actually built for economic analysis and they don't have the detail that environmental people want. Then there are two databases, EORA and Exiobase, that have different philosophies. Exiobase has said we want to have consistently for all countries a lot of sectors. But unfortunately, we said, well, then uh, we have a number of countries that we group together in the rest of the world. Where the EORA database, they made 180 countries, but then unfortunately for 100 or 130 countries, there were no input output tables, remember. So they constructed them at a very aggregated level of 26 se se sectors themselves. So they can claim I have all the countries, but actually they don't have a good detail. There is work in progress. Uh, my institute leads the Panorama project uh, with a lot of money for the kick around materials. We try to go to a thousand sectors. Stefan Gilium in Vienna is working on the fine print project with a very nice spatial analysis. But if I would go forward at this point and I would give a recommendation uh, uh, to Gigi, uh, to the knowledge platform or the UN, I would say we can actually do two things at the moment. I think if you want to do footprinting, Exiobase has the detail, but we miss a number of countries. It is relatively straightforward to mimic, uh, let's say, in Africa, the 40 countries that we miss. An ideal picture would be, however, in my view, use uh, the OECD database. That is the only one made by an international institute. It is too aggregated, but I use the type of tricks that the EORA people and my exio based people have used to detail it. There is already a kind of, of semi-official database for resource extraction that was made by the resource panel. Do then the same for carbon, water, and land. And then I'm pretty sure that in two or three years, you have something that is generally accepted and can calculate most of the environmental footprints that we want. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Arnold. Uh, it seems to be very clear. We have two questions for you. Okay. Um, one I know you will like to answer. <laughs> Can you actually um, also cover international supply chains? And um, if countries outsource their environmental impacts, can you yeah. quantify that? <clears throat> well, I probably failed because that was what I tried to explain in one of the first slides. The whole idea about input-output analysis is that you can track uh, the purchases along global supply chains. So the ID that I invite Steffi for five euros on the coffee, the five euros that I spent with the input output table, I can see where the five euros end up, who basically produces for that. And when I know who is producing for the five euros, of course, mm -hmm. I can estimate the environmental impacts at that point in the value chain. That is the whole idea behind input output analysis that you can do that. So yes, the answer is actually simply yes. A follow-up question to that. Uh, would it not be a good idea for UNFCCC to take up the concept of consumption-based criteria? What is, uh, uh, okay, what is consumption-based criteria? <laughs> consumption-based accountings in, instead of production-based. Uh, and who wants to do that? Yeah, I mean, like I said, with this tool, you can do consumption-based accounting with the push of a button. So that is easy. Mm -hmm. And I forgot and which organization. UNFCCC. Oh, the UN, oh, yeah, we, of course we did that. Actually, we had a big project, carbon cap, special issue out, hopefully by now, uh, where we did this. Uh, mm -hmm. The big problem is uh, that uh, they are afraid that by doing consumption-based accounting, you actually include more uncertainties in the assessment. Mm -hmm. And what currently all the time happens, oh, we are not certain enough. 
let's postpone any decision making. So what the UNFC doesn't want to have is that by going to consumption-based accounting, that you have another five years of discussion. We presented this all as a number of COPs, uh, so yes. So it's now more a complement to the production-based accounts. Okay, great. Then there was one question from developing countries. Yeah. Uh, why don't you engage more with them? And um, couldn't you do pilot case studies with them? Yeah. And integrate uh, them back? <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Actually, uh, I tried. Let's let's be honest. I mean, uh, if I want to do work with developing countries, like for everybody of us, it has to be funded. What I do actually at the moment is quite a few countries. Indonesia, China is not a developing country anymore. Look what they've done with the Corona issue. That is fabulous. But quite a few countries actually give their young people stipends. Uh, what I do is actually that uh, if I really see good people that want to work on these things, I have now two or three people from Indonesia working on these kind of issues. Uh, but if you ask me, can you help Nigeria or Ghana or whatever, just like that, uh, well, like, I'm happy to give some advice. But, but, but if you really want to do the data crunching and that kind of things, yeah, you need actually a lot of effort and uh, somehow that has to be paid. That's the whole thing. But frankly, my idea would be uh, uh, get a number of PhDs together from these countries, uh, get a number of people like me. I don't have to do it alone. Manfred Lenson can do it. Steffi can do it. A team like that that would work on these issues would almost be my ideal uh, to organize a group like that. Mm -hmm. We, I, I take in one more question. There are lots more but <laughs> now coming in. But uh, one more question here is also about the resource caps, and I, I gather also the planetary boundaries. Can you connect yeah. your analysis to that? Yeah, I already gave one example. And actually, if you go back to a paper in 2016 uh, that we mm -hmm. uh, published in Global Environmental Change, uh, we try to do that. The real problem is, of course, what is a planetary boundary? Well, for carbon, that is relatively straightforward. We know that by 2050, we have to go down to two ton per capita or even less now. Uh, so that is this nice line on the carbon footprint that was on one of the slides. For water, it becomes already a bit more uh, complicated, but there are some papers that say, uh, I thought it was 150 cubic meter per capita per year per annum, so we use that. Land use is straightforward. This is the amount of arable land that we have, and you just distribute it. Resources, Stephanie, you're in the panel. You know there is a big discussion. Can we even do that? Because, I mean, okay. eight ton per capita and mm -hmm. it's all sand, that is stupid mm -hmm. in my view. That is my personal opinion. <laughs> so, yeah, the problem is always, can you really, in a meaningful way, set a planetary boundary for a certain uh, environmental impact? And for some of them, it is very well possible, like for carbon, like for water, I guess, but that already is uh, region specific. And for some others, it is quite complicated. And then it becomes difficult to really make that easy. But again, give Steffi, me, others 20 PhDs and we will work it all out for you. No problem. Okay. Well, we have to cut, unfortunately, of but uh, I hope that we can take many of the questions which are coming in now for the discussion. Yeah. So thank you very much, Anna. Yeah, thank you. And with that, I'm presenting the next speaker, which is Jurens Milaikanas. He is head of the Secretariat at um, UNEP for the Lifecycle Initiative. And for those of you who don't know the initiative, it's a multi-stakeholder partnership with the aim of enabling global use of credible lifecycle knowledge by private and public decision makers. And Jurens is going to talk about SCP, the SCP head tool and the International Resource Panel. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Steffi. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, I think you're in all parts of the world, so um, glad to be here and, and uh, very highly appreciate the GGKP for uh, for organizing. And, and certainly, I wanted to give a, a warm thanks and uh, on behalf of UNEP uh, to the Swiss government for uh, for. Uh, supporting this uh, this webinar but also uh, for supporting many of the platforms and, and the initiatives that are linked here today so certainly the life cycle initiative uh, but also the the page uh, the international resource panel and and the gtkp it was actually also an initiative of uh, of the federal office of, of the environment in uh, in the swiss government uh, that brought us together in terms of um, assessing how these different indicators that we're using and that we're procuring 
uh, that we're providing, um, how how we could make them work in more synergy. So uh, thank you for that. If we move to the to the first slide, um, I was actually uh, asked to to discuss where the the green uh, economy measurement framework, uh, the the progress measurement framework how it could be using updated uh, indicators for um, uh, for all the indicators on, on environmental impacts and, and footprints that, uh, that they use, as we saw before um, in the presentation by Jose. Um, and certainly in, in UNEP, we're already using some of these indicators in, uh, in several places. So we'll start with this uh, global materials flows database that Arnold just mentioned as well. Um, so the International Resource Panel, as, as many of you know, uh, works a bit like the like the IPCC for resources, and it has been already gathering for a number of years this uh, global materials flows database, which uh, which you can see in the slide. Um, it's it's accessible. You can consult it. It covers the extraction and trade of materials. Uh, and, and in this way, it informs uh, policymakers. It informs uh, for all the world, for most countries in the world, um, and, and also in, in terms of regions. It informs both the domestic material consumption, so the, this production perspective that uh, that we've been discussing, as well as the material footprint uh, perspective. So it, it has these two indicators, which are actually relevant for the SDGs, uh, the SDG 12 and the SDG 8. Um, it builds on uh, on the Aora, uh, one of these uh, multi-region input-output uh, tables that that Arnold was mentioning, um, and from there it um, it provides this uh, this perspective on the material footprint. If we move to the next slide, then we will see that actually this um, database, this uh, global materials uh, flows database, already underpins um, several of the, the streams in the IRP and, uh, and some of the streams in UNEP. Um, so here we see the Assessing Global Resources Use, which was a, a publication uh, in, in 2017. Uh, which then built onto the Global Resources Outlook that was uh, launched one year ago, almost to the date in, um, during the United Nations Environment Assembly. This Global Resources Outlook is actually a global product that will, that will be um, produced regularly, I think every four years, um, and, and we'll see a bit more about, uh, about it uh, later on. Um, and then also the, the SCP HUD, uh, the, the Sustainable Consumption and Production Hotspots Analysis Tool, also builds on this uh, material flows database. And we'll also see a bit more uh, later. I will try to keep this presentation very, very short because it's just about presenting some of the elements, some of the resources that are being produced by UNEP, which feed on these uh, multi-region input-output uh, tables. So if we move to the next slide already, please. Um, this is just uh, some uh, snapshots of this Global Resources Outlook as one key product also that you can uh, download from the from the website. It has, I mean, obviously the, the big uh, Global Resources Outlook, the, the main uh, publication, which looks at um, not just the, 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 the impacts on resources and, and the, the, the material footprint, but also related footprints um, linked to uh, to the economy, linked to resource extraction, um, and all these uh, footprints also use. I mean, the, the impact assessment of these footprints also uses uh, the kind of footprint indicators that have been discussed um, in the previous presentations. The main publication, the Global Resources Outlook, has two sister presentations, or, or sorry, publications. One for policymakers, the the summary for policymakers, and the implications for business leaders. So where key messages out of the the Global Resources Outlook are extracted for policymakers and uh, businesses. So moving now to the final slide, please. Um, Another product that has been using this type of, um, of uh, input-output tables, the, the global multi-region input-output tables, is what we call the Sustainable Consumption and Production Hotspots Analysis Tool, or SCP HAT for short. You have the, the website, the URL, uh, there in the, in the slide, so you can go and, and play with it. This is a tool that has been pulled together by um, by a partnership of the One Planet Network, uh, the International Resource Panel, and the Life Cycle Initiative, all of them hosted in, in UNEP. 
it visualizes the footprints of nations building on uh, the EORA 26 database that, uh, that Arnold also, also mentioned in the previous presentation. Um, the, the, the data, the, the, uh, the economic flows in this multi-region uh, input-output database are then combined with footprint indicators most of them recommended by the life cycle initiative so that's also where the link to life cycle assessment indicators was made um, and this is similar to what is done for most of these footprint indicators in the global resources outlook the purpose of the scp hat is to provide evidence-based analysis uh, of the high impact areas and sectors within the national economies uh, which also obviously offer uh, good opportunities for uh, for improvements and then to inform the design and the implementation of national science-based SCP strategies, strategies for sustainable consumption and production, uh, also uh, for nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement. It is an online application, as I said, it's, it's already online, you can, uh, you can go and, and check for any country um, it provides the data and the analysis for uh, up to 171 countries uh, for the last 25 years um, and it then provides this empirical evidence of the hotspots uh, within, uh, within each economy. It has three modules, as you can see, these three screenshots uh, in, the slide, in, the, in the website, in the, sorry, in the presentation. The first one, the country profile, which is quite a simplified uh, view of a pre-selected pre list of indicators where we can see the progress of these indicators in the last years, um, the, the percentage or the, the, the importance of the imports versus the, the exports within the country and the position of each country uh, relative to the world average and, uh, and the countries that are just uh, before and just after in the ranking of that specific footprint indicator. Um, the screenshot in the middle is the module two on, on SCP hotspots, which allows you to go much more into detail of many more uh, footprint indicators uh, and also socioeconomic indicators. And we can see the contribution of each of the sectors in the economy for these 26 sectors only, so, so quite aggregated uh, sectors, not a lot of detail, but already it gives you an idea of which are the sectors in the economy that are dominating the, the footprint for that particular country. Um, and then finally, the module three can be used mainly by national statistics offices to replace the background information that we get from these uh, MRIOs. Um, so the countries that have more detailed information, they can replace the information in the tool and see the results um, directly. So that was uh, the last of my slides. I just wanted to, to introduce these and then hopefully leave the space for more discussion later on how we can use this, uh, the information within these tools, uh, perhaps in the, in the Green Economy Performance uh, Index. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jodens. Um, there were a couple of questions. The first one was, how good is your sectoral um, resolution? I suppose that was um, for the SAP head tool. I think you mentioned it afterwards. Yes, <laughs> so it's the 26 sectors that are uh, used in the EORA database. We're now working on a version two where we aim to expand this uh, sector disaggregation. But the tool that you have online, and I mean, hopefully by the end of this year, we will manage to improve that. But for the time being, uh, it's these 26 sectors. Mm -hmm. um, then there is a comment here um, from Stefan Luther. The IRP is about to switch to an MRIO based um, upon the global MRIO lab of Manfred Lenzen and colleagues. Um, alignment would be great. I think this is more for discussion later on. I think also just to mention in the global resource outlook, um, this wasn't the only tool. There was also Xiobase, which, uh, what Arno Tucker presented before integrated. So we see we have a variety of many, many tools. And I think we leave that for the discussion what, what then to do with all these different approaches. Um, but then there was also one question of understanding, which was, um, or let's say um, of clarification, do you include future scenarios in your tool? Uh, not in the SCP hat, not yet. That's certainly something that would be great to have. Uh, we, we keep it in, <laughs> in, the, in, well, in the hope that one day we'll get into putting the scenarios there. Uh, at the moment, the tool shows you the past impact, if you want, and it shows you the profile that your, car, that your country has. Certainly from this profile, you can start thinking 
which kind of policies uh, you could use to um, to improve that, but you cannot model these policies within the tool uh, for the time being. Okay. And then one last question before we need to switch on and, and then afterwards we have a little bit of time for discussion. How do you develop the country profiles and other information? As I understood, there was not enough data in many countries. Well, we build these profiles with the data that we have. Actually, um, as, as Arnold was saying, I mean, some of the data that will come, that will go into the um, EORA uh, database will have been constructed. So in a way, we have covered those gaps for the countries. You can mm -hmm. say the data didn't come directly for, for, for those countries, but has been constructed using various tricks, as, uh, as Arnold was, mm -hmm. uh, was saying. So in the end, yes, the country profiles can be built for all countries. Um, and they're all they're all there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, Jens. We see you in you. Um, in a few minutes again after um, the next presentation. Perfect, so thank let you. Me, <laughs> let me present the last speaker, Stefan Fister. Um, he's a senior scientist at ETH Zurich in the Ecological Systems Design Group. He is an expert on impact assessment methodologies and impact footprints and. Um, he will talk about how can we contribute to the green economy progress measurement framework with footprint indicators. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks a lot. And yeah, also thanks to the uh, government for funding this project we've been working on with the uh, Green Growth Knowledge Partnership. And also thanks for the support there. Uh, yeah, maybe you can go to the next slide. So the overview of the talk next is basically that I summarize more or less what the planetary balance and footprint indicators are that's been done before, so I can be fast on that. Next starting point for doing the assessment has been the this SCP hat tool presented by Lorenz before, and also the IoT analysis tool we used for constructing the environmental. Uh, footprint indicators in the global resource outlook report that has been presented by the RENS before because there was a database for the material footprint, but for assessing the environmental impact, the uh, database has not been fit for purpose because we needed to assess uh, land and water consumption related impacts on a high spatial resolution. And since the uh, Water and land use is mainly linked to agricultural and forestry production. The single sector for agriculture in era 26 has not been uh, deemed to be of enough resolution on a sector level. So then I will shortly talk about data sources we combined, the preliminary results for the analysis we've done, and what we should try to move ahead. Next. So, yeah, as mentioned, there's boundaries, for instance, those provided by Stefanet are for some indicators, but of course they are highly uncertain. They do not account for regional differences, which of course is important for land or biodiversity related impacts to, due to land use and water use impacts. So we need to have regional aspects because of course Globally, there's no water scarcity. If you just look at the total volume, but there's many regions that have severe water scarcity, and this needs to be accounted for, as has been also the result of the life cycle assessment initiative uh, workforce on, on environmental impact assessment, that this should be assessed like water consumption and land use should be assessed at the subnational level if possible. And there's not really a great threshold for, for this. On the impact side, there has been some approaches, but I think it's still ongoing in an ongoing debate. And the GET measurement framework is also presented at the beginning by Jose, uh, allowing to have thresholds based on, uh, on relative comparison with the other countries, so the percentile of performance. But this has not been done in the previous application of the of the gap index and dashboard, but this will be, I mean, we'll test this for, for this case next. So, next please. Yeah, 
So the, the footprint that has been suggested to be included is the carbon footprint for greenhouse gas emissions, land and biodiversity footprint, water footprint, and these have been covered, partially covered by the dashboard, as shown also in the graph by Jose, even though they have not been applied. And yeah, recent results from the IoT and Lifecycle Initiative provide impact assessment methods for land and water use and also has the application using Excel based MRIO data in the global resource output by IoT and for sure for carbon footprint we use the RTC factor. Next. So the NCP head tool we use has a good user interface as shown before. It has some limited functionality if you want to go beyond producer or consumer perspective. And it has missing coverage so far of water consumption and detailed biodiversity impact. The, the data and tool that has been created for the global resource outlook environmental impact assessment by uh, Lydia Kavana, uh, is published as a paper also, has used um, additional information. It has, although it has a limited user interface, so it's more for advanced user, you can download and extract the data, but it's not providing a, a nice user interface. It has some enhanced functionality, so you can assess also specific sectors or country's whole economy. And it also covers the regionalized assessment of biodiversity and what is the impact. Next, please. So there are some other tools that cover they also provide MRIO tools, but they don't cover the water quality uh, and biodiversity impact utility. So what we did, because we needed to cover more than 100 countries for, for this uh, update of the GAP measurement framework, uh, we had to combine EORA that is used in the FCP hub data and Excel base uh, used by Carbona with the extensions of the environmental footprint. This allows to set all three footprints and it has the country resolution of the aura and detailed sector and extension from Excel data. So we couple this with spatial explicit assessment for agriculture and forestry for land and water use. So it allows us to have subnational assessment of environmental impact while the trade analysis is done on the national level. Next. So this is just, uh, yeah, these are clean bit cheap, but just the, in general, the calculation of the indicator is basically taking one five years average uh, time series of footprints from 2001 to 2005 is the starting period, and 2011 to 2015 is the, the more recent period. And the progress is basically calculated as a change, and, and yeah, the graph has been distorted by switching to the white screen ratio. So the change over the change that is targeted. So we have the target change, which is the y zero minus the y star, and we have the actual change. And I think Jose explained a bit, I can go into more details if, need, if, if needed, but in principle, we compare a change to a targeted change. And this can be, of course, for the indicators, we can have the consumption perspective, which is the capital footprint, or we can have a domestic production perspective, where we assess the impact of domestic production that occurs domestically. Next, please. So, here is just, yeah, here is, uh, it's just applying this indicator to all the countries based on the recent results, um, MRIO data, and you see this is the greenhouse gas impact of domestic production. Blue is progress, so many European and also the US uh, countries have, have advanced, have progress, so have lower carbon footprints now than before. Okay, next. While if you look at the consumption perspective, so the carbon footprint, you see many of the countries are not that well progressing anymore. So we have a lot of emerging economies in Asia, South America, developing economies in Africa, and also Central European countries that actually have uh, a negative progress, so they do worse than before. 
Uh, we see for the US there is some decoupling uh, that has also been reported by the Global Resource Outlook, but are rather on the weak side. And as mentioned before, so there's a starting point, of course, there's a high starting point for these high developed economies. Next. And yeah, here is the same for water scarcity, impact of domestic production, clearly seeing some countries have very low uh, or have, have improved on the impact. Next. While again, on the footprint perspective, it hasn't been that, uh, that progressing for especially developed economies, indicating that they basically start having increased import and uh, reduce or at least limit the domestic production, agricultural production, which is dominating modern society. And next, the same basically can be seen for land use. While on average, the trend from global databases says there's a slight decrease of land use, but that can be is challenged uh, by different data sources. So here we have rather high uncertainty. Next. And again, for the consumption perspective, of course, the picture is also again changing to those countries that also import that might have nationally no increase. Next. So this has just been a summary, and now we integrated it into the gap measurement framework. And I skip with this the, all the points, but the recommendation is basically to replace the ecological footprint, which has been present in the uh, dashboard already by carbon land and water footprint, including the impact assessment. And yeah, so it, in essence, that allows to have more detail because ecological footprint is combining uh, carbon footprint and land use. Next. And here is now just the summary of what it means for the gas index and the uh, dashboard. So here's the result of the GAP index as presented already by, by Jose before. So here we just have hungry countries because we lost uh, five countries on the way. Um, next, please. So what you see is basically, yeah, that mainly uh, Asian countries had a, a low progress. And if we analyze the dashboard and the GAP index together, we can have this comparison on the protective criteria uh, result that basically takes the world progress as indication of the overall progress so kind of how actually more how bad the country is doing so here we integrated the water land and carbon footprint from the consumption perspective with the gas index shown before and you see the picture now is much more red that means uh, there are several countries that have no or bad progress in terms of borderland or carbon footprint. Next. If you compare this to the original report by the protective criteria in, in the application from 2007 that Jose mentioned, there is a much lower impact. If you look at the scale, they have um, all these very red regions or anything that's not gray has really low uh, progress like minus progress, and this is mainly related to the nitrogen emission. So there's a there's a very high uh, kind of share of countries that have very low progress in terms of nitrogen emissions because usually these countries started intensifying agriculture and therefore at higher emissions. Next. So just that's the same. So if we add now land, water, and carbon footprint to this uh, result from the previous uh, publication. So we see it's more or less looking the same, but still in 36 of 100 cases, uh, there was a lower progress for water land or carbon than was in the set of the original criteria. So there is some change by using this uh, additional indicator. Next. So one important point is the uncertainty. And in principle, what you see here is on the x-axis, you have the ATP hat result, basically based on the euro for carbon footprint, only for the very high 
you will develop in the index countries. And on the y axis, you have the original exile base in orange and the resource exile base EORA uh, data in blue, which is what we use now to, to have this full coverage. And you see there's some, the, the circles indicate where we have a different sign of the progress. And that's something we probably don't want to have. And also we see that in many cases, uh, the difference is significant since for carbon footprint on the, not the, not the progress, but just the real footprint size, the difference is not so high. And what we see at the very right, the two dots at around progress of four for the SDC hut is Romania, which I think is a good example because it's not one of the main countries in the global economy. And therefore the difference between the two databases usually are higher. Next. So the next is already the final slide. So I think like just for the next step. So as a result of the study, the suggestion to include as a first priority carbon footprint. And then as a second priority check for land and water footprints to be included in the gap uh, framework. And of course, there's many challenges like methodologically for the index itself. And so they also mentioned there's some flexibility, but of course needs also to be discussed. And especially for instance, of the consumption or production perspective has to be covered or both. And data challenges as discussed before different MRO databases have different strengths and weaknesses. And one suggestion is actually to create a task force to define next steps to develop a harmonized input output database and try to kind of merge the different initiatives and find a, and provide a, a more strength result or stronger result. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, as we are close to the end, please very briefly answer to the questions. We have a couple, um, and then I will go over to the overall discussion. One question, what about public health impacts? Yeah, like in this uh, analysis, that's neglected, so that's definitely important, but uh, was not included in the study. Okay, that was brief. How many, uh, how much of the progress indicators, how many of the progress indicators are influenced by GDP development? Uh, we didn't test this, but uh, of course there's a, uh, I think like that, that, that's a very interesting um, question because of course increased uh, affluence usually leads to increased uh, consumption patterns, so especially on the consumption side there's, there's a link, but we didn't test it uh, in this study. Okay, and then the last one, um, how can data measurement indices be used for your investment decisions? Yeah, I mean that's that's of course up to up to the team you you're, you're basing your decisions on. But in principle, I would I would rather say that these countries that have low progress require investment in order to improve the progress. But uh, often the conclusion is that investments are not done in these countries because they're considered uh, to be then uh, red flag. But uh, I think if for investment, I think additional assessment is required. All right. Thank you very much to all the presenters. Now I would like in, to invite the panel. We are almost at the end of our regular time, but I would propose we, we um, go over time. I heard from the organizer that is possible. So we will add another 10 minutes and we hope that the audience bears with us. So um, please join again, everybody. Um, and I would like to use the time to, to ask a first question. We have seen there are multiple tools available and, um, and not all represented here. One of the comments was hinting at that there are more tools and another comment was also hinting that there are initiatives um, of the statistical offices to actually report uh, energy accounts, um, air emission accounts and so on in the official statistics. Um, so we have multiple data sources, multiple tools. Um, do we need that variety to be able to compare them later on, or should we all aim for one best practice tool? And what would that be? So that would be my first question to the panelists. Oh gosh, shall I start? <laughs> Is it an open question? Can I start? Uh, sure, mm -hmm. go ahead. 
Uh, I would say one of the things what is for me very important is you do it totally transparent and that you do it totally open. Uh, one of the problems I saw a question of Stefan Luther, we know it sort of very well about uh, what is it, uh, this EA lab. The problem is that I only plug in data there. I can never use it and it is controlled somewhere in a way that I cannot have it. Uh, and that is for me something that you cannot have. Uh, what I would say is that organizations like the Green Growth Knowledge Platform, we had the same discussion about the scenario tools, uh, for the International Resource Panel. Ideally, you want to have open source things. It cannot be that you give a kind of preference to one party or something like that. It has to be open and usable by everybody. And then I'm fine with everything. Then you have to put together a number of people that say, well, this is the best way of doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can go two directions. You can say, well, let's go for one, one outcome. But then in reality, the reality is, of course, that you can actually create multiple realities when you want to map global value chains. So sometimes actually that you have multiple databases is an advantage because then you can see the uncertainties better. There is no one truth in this world. Yeah. So you, you kind of said now both should be there, yeah. so the diversity, but maybe we should also um, aim for one best practice. I maybe yeah. um, go over to you then, because you are very experienced in international working groups and um, finding best practice in, in different fields, not in this one though. Um, what do you think about that? Uh, yes, I think, but I think Arnold summarized it well, I think it's good to have uh, one place where we kind of have the, the reference that we use for uh, regular monitoring and, and reporting, um, while at the same time it's very useful to have, um, you know, other approaches that are, you know, perhaps not what has been agreed at the global level, but that are kept on, on, and that researchers particularly can continue to look at that to then highlight and, and stress, raise a flag, whenever there is something that is consistently going in a different direction and say, hey, you know, there might be something about here that you're not considering in the, you know, agreed, uh, in, in the agreed approach that is kind of used officially. So I think certainly it makes sense to have one approach that we can use for these kind of global assessments. So we're not confronting differences at every study that, that is being presented, uh, but then at the same time to keep watching brief and to keep looking at the potential uh, diversion views that that could uh, that could appear and that maybe needs to be incorporated into the global um, agreement hope, hope that makes sense yes okay any of the other panelists who want to say something about this topic yeah i just think like we have some learning from uh, yeah, we have some learning from the like life cycle initiatives and then we have this Kind of working groups for the impact assessment, and this might be a way of to to try to come up with a uh, with a way at least like to get experts together to to think about how could this be done to get at the common uh, input output table, and rather than just picking one or the other, and whoever gets the, the kind of the, the job to do the database design for this background or the backbone of the of the input output table. So. I think it would make sense maybe to to have kind of a working group to or task force that, that sit together and at least discuss what would be steps that would be possible and at the end maybe there is a solution or not, but at least to have these also hopefully discussed. Anybody wants to react on that? Otherwise I would maybe switch no. to another. That's okay. Maybe can, can I add one thing? Yeah. I think mm -hmm. my slides are set. There is now actually one. Uh, global input output database of the OECD. And I think that has a bit more status that uh, of any of uh, what the research databases mm -hmm. are. Uh, maybe I'm going to now again into some problematic things because the UN and the OECD sometimes it doesn't go really well together. But I would say take something like that uh, and build anything else that you want to elaborate on that basis because then at least you have a supranational thing. That is uh, that has a certain status. So we need a new database. Um, no, it is there. Learning but from the, other past development. No, the point is the OCD database is there. It's just aggregated. No, yeah, okay. Well. Okay. 
Um, let me let me raise another question which came very often in the chat, and that's why I want to raise it. So um, there were many questions about the regional resolution, and um, many of the or several at least of the of the audience. Um, of the representatives of, of us, can we go below country level? Is there a way to to go on a subnational scale? Yeah. yeah. Maybe can maybe I... Jose can start because we yes. haven't heard you for a long time. Oh okay. well, yeah, and and actually I want to share a couple of the experience uh, with the application of the methodology. So we have done both uh, uh, subnational application uh, in the case of China uh, for one province. Uh, we have. We have, you know, discussed with with a university uh, and give uh, technical guidance on how to apply the methodology to their own context. With what are the indicators that they should use? So uh, that has been done uh, at least for one experience in, in a university in China and uh, a province. And and we are currently working with the government of South uh, Africa to do an implementation at the country level of the methodology. And that has, of course, come up to different stages. One is the stage of validation. What are the indicators? What are the, their priorities in terms of the topics that they want to cover? And, and, and actually, after we have that, we are gathering uh, in the process of gathering the official data to do the calculation. So these things could be applied and, and make context specific. So that is, is of course, uh, used at the more policy level data. But I always encourage that they have some connection with this global benchmarking so that they could position their country in a broader perspective and learn from policy experiences in other countries. Yeah, can I add two or three? <clears throat> that is certainly possible, of course, it all depends on data. Uh, China has, for instance, a multi-regional table for China at province level. Uh, that has been used by various authors to do carbon footprinting, water footprinting at the subnational level. What I did together with Tsinghua University, we did the material footprint, nice paper in PNAS uh, two months ago. Uh, and then we have an Indonesian uh, PhD that works with uh, a provincial Indonesian uh, table. And the whole trick is all the time that you have these tables at the provincial level or the subnational level and link them then to a global input output table that you can do something with it. Uh, the people in Vienna, the fine print project, even do it spatially explicit. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of opportunities to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <clears throat> Anybody else to add? For regional resolution before we continue? Yeah, I think it's always, uh, it's always a question like the more regional you get, the more Often you have more estimates, so often you can you can track data or recall custom data, for instance, about national boundaries. And as soon as you go subnational, often you need to add some additional um, yeah, additional methods. But but yeah, I I think like there's ongoing work that, that can help to, to at least detect uh, or estimate subnational levels too. Mm -hmm. Um, Niklas, I would like to ask you, um, as somebody using these tools, what do you wish for? Niklas? <laughs> He's not anymore with us. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. I think he that. has the mic uh, not open. Yeah, he can Okay. Um, Niklas, once you unmute, unmute yourself, please tell us. So maybe um, we continue then he, with. He, with he, he can. Is it working now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm very sorry for this. Um, I think it's very valid what has been said by Lawrence, for example, and other participants that, on the one hand, having a multi regional input output table that has credibility, that has an official status, and also when you communicate the results, you don't have to start from scratch every time um, new, so you don't always have to argue, yes, we have used this method, and um, UNEP LCI has recommended it, so it's kind of official, but to have this official status, this credibility. But on the other hand, of course, I support also the scientific autonomy and the diversity so that um, there's also progress in the different approaches and as Arnold Tucker said 
sometimes there are multiple realities in, in this world and this has um, also its legitimacy. Great. <laughs> I think this, um, this was almost a good closure um, statement. Um, I would like to ask the panel, um, does, does anybody want to add something to this topic which you think hasn't been addressed enough before we leave? Maybe what we haven't addressed very much is the synergy between the gap tool and the, um, the impact indicators and the footprint. It has been raised in, in Stefan's presentation, but maybe Jose can also tell us a little bit how you see that going. And then yeah, I, 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 hmm. I took good notes of, of the presentation and I think it's a, uh, it's a quite welcome addition to, to, to the framework. I, 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 I was also a little bit having the same questions that Stefan uh, closed. Shall we um, create uh, and publish calculations using footprint and using the production side? Shall we try to combine them into one single uh, uh, unit or shall we use them as a band? You say, what happens if you calculate things using one methodology, what happens if you use the other? Um, I definitely think that uh, this, this webinar has been a, a great uh, starting point to, to think about these, these ideas and, and as we take advantage of existing databases, uh, as uh, has been explained, I think we call all can improve our insight. So I, I um, am quite welcome uh, the, the use of uh, footprint indicators and as we have more let's say established methodologies and data available, I think that job will, will be easier for us. So I, I think this is a great start to, to start thinking how we can combine both. And I, I think this is perfectly, uh, uh, you know, implementable. So we just need to keep thinking and adding uh, input from, from everyone. Um, Jurens, I heard you want to add something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, no, just to jump in, but I think, um, so in terms of, uh, I don't know if it's a summary, but certainly I think it's it's quite welcome. I mean, it's very good to see all of this progress. Um, I think it's also incredibly refreshing to see that in the last uh, few years, many countries have started looking beyond their borders. So looking at, okay, how do we, uh, ensure that the progress that we're making in terms of becoming more sustainable is not just within our borders, the domestic production perspective, but also what are our economies driving elsewhere. Um, I think we're then realizing that these kind of tools are extremely useful for that and that we need some sort of official version. So I think in this sense, it would, what would be interesting to see is how can we look at uh, countries and, and, you know, in the perspective of, uh, of perhaps the, the Environment Assembly, the, the UN Environment Assembly, how can we push for this kind of tools? Uh, probably the, the IRP is already well placed um, to, to host this kind of, uh, of database. Um, and then to bring the, the experts that are around this uh, table, but certainly other experts who are not here today, um, to work on, okay, what is the, the best thing that we can put out there for this kind of analysis, not to stop the, the research, not to stop any other perspectives, but to have, uh, as we were saying, one stable uh, MIRO that is maintained, so put enough resources to, to create and to maintain this thing, um, and then build the official assessments, the, the global resources outlook, the, the global environment outlook, to build the, the relevant um, processes out of this uh, one uh, reference uh, table. Um, so certainly I think this, this would be something that would be kind of a, a good conclusion out of this workshop. Hopefully we can take this forward, uh, put it to the right audience and, uh, and, and get, well, the, the necessary people around the table and the necessary resources to, uh, to make it happen. Great. I think that was really a good closure and we also have to finish now. I would like to thank um, everybody here, so the panel, but also the audience who was incredibly active. I wasn't able to follow up all the comments and questions, unfortunately, but I saw that um, some answers were already given on the chat and I hope that will um, also continue after this webinar. 
Um, I think it was a good, very nice start and hopefully um, a start of a bigger initiative. Uh, we had many constructive comments of how it could go forward. And I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Have Thanks. a nice evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take care and stay healthy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You too. Bye. Take care.